So thank you for you all being here uh, for my talk. Welcome to my talk about XAI meets natural language processing. Um, so this talk will be about explainable AI, about different options to yeah, use explainable AI techniques to natural language processing problems. Um, just a quick remark beforehand. Um, I'm in the middle of my work about this topic, so um, I cannot guarantee you any completeness. Um, I'm still like trying things out, I'm doing research, so if you have any additions or remarks for me, any tips, um, I would be also be grateful and we can maybe have a chat after the talk. Um, so maybe before I start, some words about me. Uh, I'm Larissa. I'm uh, from Heidelberg. I studied um, politics and data science in Mannheim before work, uh, starting to work as a data scientist in Heidelberg at Savanta AG. Um, in my spare time, I like to do sports, play ultimate frisbee, play round net, and read a lot of science fiction. So if you want to chat about that, that's also pretty fine. Um, and now I'm working a lot with um, business processes and the automation of business processes, um, especially like in the NLP, in the natural language processing area. So um, recently I was involved in a customer project um, that made me think about explainability um, in yeah, the terms of NLP, so how to explain um, predictions made with NLP models and um, systems. So, maybe you've heard about that term, um, explainable AI, maybe you haven't. Um, I first want to talk briefly about what it is. So, um, explainable AI are processes and methods to um, understand your AI systems better. So, the goal is to increase the accuracy of your model, because when you understand your AI systems better, you can, for example, discover um, biases. I don't know if you were at the talk yesterday by Sonam, and um, she really explained really good um, how you can see the, the biases in your data and in your AI system by yeah, looking into the black box. Um, another goal is to increase um, yeah, the fairness of your systems. So it also is connected to, to um, yeah, the biases and to have better outcomes of your predictions. Also, when looking into the future, it might be like a legal requirement to, for your um, AI systems to be explainable. Um, it's not, I think it's not official yet, but um, there are tendencies for, for example, users that they can request why, for example, they were put in a certain category. So, um, yeah, you might want to think about this um, also in the legislation way. Um, right now, I'm just talking about AI systems. Um, why is that? As AI system involves the whole process that you see here. So, from the data selection, the data collection, um, the setup, which model you're using, which parameters you use, um, over feature engineering, the structure, um, the model that you use, and the, the decisions it um, makes. This is all connected to the, yeah, to the AI system, but I think the first four parts, they are just quite visible. I mean, you can present your data, you can um, visualize it, you can explain the features that you engineered, maybe it's a little bit more complex, but it's like, it's a tangible topic and you can explain it, while um, models and decisions, they are more a black box. Um, you cannot easily plot a model and explain why it has, why it comes to certain predictions or not. So, um, yeah, in the next couple of minutes, I want to focus on the last two steps. So I'm, I won't talk about how to visualize your data, but I want to keep you in mind that this is also important and it's also part of explainability when you start thinking about that term. Um, why even bother about explainability? I already yeah, gave some, um, some ideas about that. There are a lot of reasons why explainability is important. Um, it's not only for the end users who want to know why certain predictions are made. It's also for us as technical staff to know 
how our mo models behave to maybe make them better, to improve the outcomes, but also depending on your role, for, for example, um, if you're a manager and you have to, um, yeah, you have to, to speak about why you're using AI and why you're using a certain model and a certain system, it's always good to know what's happening under the hood and what, yeah, how the decisions are made. Um, this is especially important uh, to think about explainability in NLP because the models or the AI systems, they solve tasks with text and text is closely connected to human beings. When you have NLP models, most of the time they work closely together with um, human co-workers and they, they need to trust and they need to understand the predictions of the model. So especially in NLP it's important um, to think about explainability. And one last remark, explainability is also closely connected to AI ethics. Um, there are a lot of great videos, a lot of great talks about that topic. It's also important to see those two topics together, but when I start talking about that, uh, we will probably be a little bit over time. So um, I want to present you some approaches, some options, how to deal with um, explainability in NLP projects. Um, you can roughly divide uh, the, the approaches into um, four sections. So on the one hand, you have um, model agnostic and model specific approaches. Model agnostic approaches are independent of the model um, that you're using. So it's a, yeah, really good point if you have a setup, you have already introduced explainability, you can just easily switch the model behind it and leave your setup as it is because it's model agnostic. You can just yeah, keep working with your explainable um, setup and maybe improve the model, don't think about, oh, I need to keep with the decision tree because I already built my whole system on the values of, this, of the decision tree. Um, and then on the other hand, you have the decision between global and local explainability, where um, global explains the impact for the whole data set and local um, explains an impact only for one prediction. So you have here, for example, um, two the, the image of the decision tree. When you have global explainability, you take the whole decision tree into account so you can explain each prediction that is made from that tree. Um, and on the right hand side, you have um, only one path of the decision tree, so um, you can use this explainability only to explain this single prediction that was made. This is like the um, distinction between global and local explainability. So, um, yeah, based on the experience I made in this customer project with um, explainability and the different approaches that um, we tried, I want to just show you the, those approaches and maybe give some, some feeling if this approach could fit also for your, um, for your kind of problems. So, um, the first idea, I don't know if you ever thought about it, but you can use human annotations. You can, if you have a data set and it gets labeled by humans, you can just ask them and include reasons why they edit the label. Um, it's, I think it's really cool if you have the chance to do that. Um, you, get, you can use then the reason as a, another label and let it be predicted by your model. Um, but I mean, in the end, it's not explainability how the model came to the conclusion that this label is right, but what the model thinks that the human coworker thought why this label w was right. But I just think it's a, it's a cool idea. Um, it's a cool way to think about explainability. And if you know that option, it also makes you think about which kind of explainability do I want in my, um, in my process, in my AI system. Um, another option is to use feature importances and model structures that you just have from your model. 
Um, so, for example, there is um, BERT. I don't know if you're familiar with BERT. Um, there are also a lot of great talks about that topic. Um, it's a very common NLP model type. Um, and it, it's trained in different layers. And you can use the layers, um, send data through it, and yeah, observe the, the attention of those, um, of those layers to certain words. So for example, um, this is um, the third um, layer of a bird model. And um, the color of the words indicate how much you can change the word without changing the sentence. So a very dark color means there is only a little um, yeah, space you can move the word. A lighter color is you can just change the word and the sentence would keep its meaning. So for example, if you would change bird, it would change the meaning of the sentence quite a lot. But for example, to or has, like those um, auxiliary verbs or auxiliary um, words, they are not that important. So you can just use the structure that is already there to get a glimpse on how your model um, uh, comes to conclusions. But it depends. I mean, if you're not using BERT or if you're not using a model that allows you to do this, this is not the right option for you. Then, third, I mean, you could always use understandable models. Um, this is quite difficult, I think, for NLP topics, but I don't know if you've ever seen NLP data. I mean, you have text. Most often, you transform text into numbers, into word embeddings, into um, vectors. So it's really difficult. You can train decision trees on NLP data, on embeddings, but in the end, even, you, even though you can understand the model and the tree structure, you, it wouldn't help you. I mean, you then see, okay, the third um, value in my vector has a high impact, so okay, but what that, does that mean? Um, but I don't know. It could be that you have NLP data that it's really good for decision trees. It's an option you can try, or also for regression or other interpretable um, or understandable models. It really depends on the data if this will work. Another option um, are Lime, Shep, and Li5. I just um, heard that yesterday there was a great talk about Lime also, so um, I won't go into too much detail here, so maybe just um, then ask the expert about that. But um, yeah, in short, Lime and Shep, they work with correlations. So you have your model, which is a black box, and it does not depend on which model it is used, so it's a model agnostic approach. You use this black box and you um, put data through it. You take your data, you permutate your data points, um, feed it into your model, observe the prediction, and then correlate how the permutation and the change prediction um, correlates. So I think it's a really cool approach. Um, on the top you see um, an example how this works with images. So you have an image, you have the prediction, this is a frog. And then you um, mask or you permutate um, single parts of the picture and you observe how the prediction changes. So in this case, um, the first picture, it still has like 85% uh, to be a frog. And then you just take those results, put it into an understandable model, into an explainable model, and um, yeah, observe how the weights um, behave, and we can now see in this frog example that the face is a really important indicator for this model that the picture shows a frog. Um, I think that's really cool. The problem is that this, that Lime in this case only works for local um, explainability, um, so you can all, you can just like explain for this single example for this picture um, the, the importance of the face uh, to be yeah, important. And then there's, um, there are SHAP values. Um, SHAP values, they can be local, but also um, used for global explainability. And um, 
You can see here example with text, so shape values show how much single elements, uh, for example, in a sentence, contribute to the overall prediction. Um, so you can imagine it just like a, a football team. Each player has his or her own um, yeah, impact on the game and the outcome is like the, the team performance. Um, the differences between Lime and Shep, I have a little example um, I want to explain now. So Imagine you have a, um, a classification if a YouTube comment is spam or no spam. In this case, you have the um, data point for Christmas song, visit my channel. I think it's spam. <laughs> um, then to, um, to, to try out or to test your model, you take this sentence, you, you just separate it into words, into tokens, and then you mask the tokens. So for example, when there is a one, um, the word is there. When there is a zero, the word is masked, so taken out. And you have um, the probability um, that the model says, OK, this is still spam or this is no spam. So for example, the third and the fourth option were just for visit my channel is still with a high probability, it's still um, spam. And then you have the differences between Lime and Shep, and this is in the weighting of this probability um, in their calculation. So Lime is just weight, weighting um, the probability with how close is my permutation to the original sentence. And for Shep it is how, um, how many um, coalitions do I have? Oh, I see I have a typo there. So how many coalitions do I find? Have I have, do I have a high amount of ones or a high amount of zeros? Because the theory is you can single out single impacts. So if I have, for example, everything masked except for channel, I still have a high probability, and this is just quite cool because I see that the word channel has a high probability for my model to classify something as spam. And this is also very high weighted by SHAP. And this is also why you can use SHAP for global explainability and not just only for local. Um, then there is LI5. Um, LI5, I don't know um, if you knew, but it stands for explain like I'm five. And I think um, it's, just, it's just also a cool method to use. It yeah, kind of works in a similar way. It um, shows the contribution a word has or yeah, a word has to um, a certain prediction. And um, it's nice that it works out of the box for the scikit-learn pipelines. So you can, it's not completely model agnostic, but you can use it for different scikit-learn um, algorithms, and it also takes the preprocessing into account. So it really works well um, if you have the, the setup that um, it, it's required here. Now, my um, last approach that I want to present are graphical representations. Um, I think they are really good, especially for explaining what NLP is and how NLP works. Um, you can use, for example, if you have word embeddings, um, word vectors into use, you can use, um, for example, a dimensional reduction to um, bring your word vectors into a two-dimensional shape. Um, and then you can just see where the points are located on your um, data grid. For example, I don't know if you know this one, is um, Vispert. It's a um, Q&A um, website, so you can ask a bird model a question, and um, the question gets answered, and you can observe how the layers um, move or push the points on this grid around, so how the, answers, how the answer gets shaped by the different layers. And I think it's really cool to visualize how this model works. But on the other hand, I mean, you have always a dimensional reduction. You come from 300, 400 dimensions, and you reduce it to two dimensions. I mean, some information gets lost there. But I really think it's a cool approach 
and it's it's really tangible to to see okay i have words that are closely connected um, and i have differences between others so these were my five um, approaches that i wanted to show you today um, i also included a little table where you have maybe some my personal evaluation um, there are also great articles in the web um, that also do similar things um, in case you want to keep those links i will upload the slides in my github so um, you can you don't have to, to manually type them in now um, just to to sum everything up what are difficulties for nlp models um, you have the high amount of dimensions, um, that is clearly a difficulty. You have um, a high variability in models and representations. It's not like numerical data, which you can just like show in numerical way. You um, have a bag of words, you have maybe a skipgram model, you have um, biograms, you have embeddings, word vectors. So it really depends on your use case what explainability you can use. What I find pretty difficult is a set of tokens is not equal to variables. So a set of tokens is more like image data because you have always to keep the context into account and it's not just like numbers that appear uh, together. Then you have this switch from local to global um, explainability, which I think it's also um, the transfer is also quite difficult. and. Um, because of the size and the dimension and the complexity of word vectors, it's also too difficult. It's also difficult to show is show this um, on in a graphical way. I mean, for numbers, you can just plot plot them. You can have a histogram. You can have curves. But for um, for word vectors, for example, I mean, you can print them out. But then you have a dictionary size printout, and nobody wa knows what to do with it. Um, and the last difficulty I see here, and this was especially in my customer project important, even absent words are important. So if, for example, in a comment you have a word that is not used, it's also, it's just important for the prediction that some words are not used. And how do you show this on a grid? I mean, you don't have the data point there for this word. Um, how do you show this in a in a table where you have the impacts. You have a lot of words that are not there, but also have an impact. Um, so this, is, this was one, um, one point that I found pretty difficult to explain and also to show. So just a quick wrap up about the um, customer project. I won't go into detail here. Um, just this was how we explained it to the customer. We had um, text training data. Um, we had we made some feature engineering, so we did uh, word complexity measurements, um, sentence length, um, word variability measurements, and then we had embeddings. So in this case, a custom TF-IDF um, embedding mechan mechanism, and we combined it into a model. And in the end, we had a POC dashboard where the customer could see for a single prediction how this prediction yeah, was, was done. So we had on the top, um, like the, the binary um, prediction in class R or class B, and then we had uh, aggregation of um, aggregation of shape values depending on the location in the text. So we knew, okay, our text is structured in a certain way. We have four different paragraphs, and we can just aggregate the shape values within the paragraphs. And this made it very tangible for the customer because they could see, okay, the paragraph four had a lot, had a big impact into this prediction. And then we just had the engineered features also as shape values separated from the normal TF-IDF. And to wrap everything up, um, my lessons learned from this project, you have to really think about how to explain the explainability. So it's not enough to just calculate the values. You have to explain to the customer what these values mean, and this is 
I think, a greater challenge than just calculate them. Um, how do you present it? How do you make it understandable? Um, also, the absence of words. How do you display them? Do you even talk about it? I mean, do you want to open that, um, that box um, to explain how these models work? Um, you have to find a fitting representation. You have to, to include help texts to, for the customer or for the user to understand it. And you really have to reduce complexity to the topic that the user really wants to know about this prediction. So, um, I also included some of the articles that I used for this presentation, also for research. There are really great, great articles out there. Just um, have a look at them. And um, if you want to keep in contact, um, you can always chat with me on Twitter or on LinkedIn, and you find the slides on GitHub. So, thank you for your attention. Thank you for your amazing talk. That was so interesting. I'm pretty new on that topic, uh, and I feel like I've just learned a lot. Um, we have a lot of questions, <laughs> oh, <yes. laughs> so I guess I was not alone in enjoying this. Um, and we probably won't get through them all, but hopefully you don't mind folks to come up to you afterwards. Yes, yes of course. Um, but let's try to address some of the top voted ones. So Alina is asking, the examples you showed are all document classification problems. Have you explored the approaches for other NLP tasks, i.e. translation, named entity recognition? So um, for translation, I unfortunately have no experience. Um, for NER, I think you can just um, use also the model agnostic approaches because you just take the model as a black box and wrap the explainer around and it doesn't really like matter what's inside, so I think you can just use the approaches and try out, try it out. So maybe Alina, who asked the question, can also try that out <laughs> and let us know. <laughs> okay, so I didn't get the difference between local and global. Could you um, please explain it to me like I'm five? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can try. <laughs> so um, imagine you have a lot of people, like you see here in this picture, you have a, a group of people and you want to, you have a model that specify, that, that predicts the first letter of your name. Um, and when you have global explainability, you can just explain the prediction from your model for each of the people in your, in your group. When you have a local explainability, you have to pick one of them out and you can explain why the model predicted a name with an A at the beginning, but you don't know about the others. So this is just a difference. Um, global explainability usually is a lot more costly, so you have to think about do I really need data from all of the data points, or is it enough that I can just explain single predictions and um, yeah, do not need information about the whole data set. That's a great explanation, I would say. Hopefully it also <laughs> answered the person that asked it. If maybe not, not, maybe they can come find you. Maybe five years was not the threshold. But <laughs> <laughs> a smart five-year-old. Uh, <laughs> if you ask your human annotators for their label explanations, how can you encode that data and use it within the uh, X, uh, XAI mm -hmm. algorithm? So you can, for example, I don't know, I come from the social sciences and when we label text or when we um, yeah, have, a, have a data set, we, in the beginning we create a, um, a rule set how to label data and you could do just the same. So you could, for example, have a set of categories, like 10 categories, and the human annotator could select one of them as a reason, for example. So you have a, a fixed set of options and then you could use it as a label to be predicted. Or they can just, maybe then they also can single out words that they used for their label. So, for example, in, a, a, in the spam um, example, you can just highlight the channel as an important word and you can just use this later on. Yeah, it's very interesting suggestions. Um, 
Okay, so let's say we find out that channel is important for classifying something, as you mentioned the channel, uh, as spam. To what extent is that a fundamental explanation of the model? I mean, it's, um, it's not an explanation like how the model did this, because this is just, uh, I mean, the model is probably a mathematical construct and um, you could also just print the some of the weights in your neural net, but this won't help you as a human to understand. Um, and if you have um, the importance of the word, it's always a trade-off between what gives the model you as information and what does a human need, a human being need to understand it. So... I think most of us need some some text, some context to understand values and not just can see, okay, I have here a vector of 300 um, values and now I see, okay, this one was the most important one. So you, you always need, th there's always a trade-off between accuracy of the, the model prediction or the explanation of the model prediction and the understandability for a human being. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great answer, thank you. Um, okay, well, uh, can you use the graphical methods on the whole texts somehow, not only word vectors? Um, I mean, there are word clouds, but I, <laughs> I'm not a great fan of word clouds. Um, I'm not sure what this question is referring to. I mean, usually you can count words and just have a histogram. Um, maybe... I'm not the right person to ask. Maybe we can ask a, a linguist. I mean, they have great ways to visualize text in in their yeah in their text form, not in a word vector form. But just have a look at that. I think they have they have great ideas there. Thank you again. Um, okay, so we're running a bit over, so I'm not going to go through the rest of the questions, but would really invite you to reach out to Larissa, and you already shared yes. your information on how folks can do so if they can't find you in the conference today. Uh, just one last one. It's not a question, but I wanted to read it out anyway, which was great talk, <laughs> and I 100% agree. <laughs>